welcome to chapter one. We'll be covering section 1.2 in this video. The best way to do this video is for you to have your textbook out, take notes alongside with the video, pause often, and try the problems on your own. The key concept of section 1.2 is collecting and using sample data to make conclusions about populations. These are the important vocabulary and important terms. There is a lot of important vocabulary, so be ready to pause and take good notes. Our first vocabulary is parameter versus statistic. A parameter is a numerical measurement describing the population, and a statistic is measuring something about the sample. So a good alliteration here is population parameter and sample statistic to help you remember those two words. So let's look at this example. There are this many high school students in the U.S., and in a study of that many high school students 16 years of age or older, that percent of them said that they texted while driving at least once during the previous 30 days. Identify the population in the sample and what would be a parameter and what would be a statistic of this study. So the population is going to be all of the high schoolers. And the sample is going to be the small amount that actually were a part of the study. And that 44.5% is a statistic because it's data about the sample. If we somehow knew something about that 17 million high school students, that how they reported texting while driving, then that percentage would be a parameter. But because we only have the information about the sample, that would be a statistic. Go ahead and give it a try. Press play when you're ready to see the answer. There you go. So quantitative data or numerical data consists of numbers that can be counted or measured. So the weights of wrestlers, the ages of respondents. Categorical or qualitative data consists of names or labels. Now, sometimes you do have numbers, but the numbers can't really be counted or measured, and they're more about like names. So for example, like a shirt number um, or gender, these are qualitative data. So data can be split into two, qualitative and quantitative. All right, so we've got this example here. Identify each as quantitative or categorical or qualitative. So the ages of the subjects, the genders, male and female, and the identification numbers. So the ages of subjects is a numerical count that we can measure. So that is going to be quantitative. The genders are labels. They're male, female. We can't add or subtract the word male and female. So those are categorical or qualitative data. Now the last one's a little confusing because it, it is a number, but these are identification numbers. They're almost like names of people. It wouldn't make sense to do three minus one here because it's subtracting names. So it's categorical data, even though it is a number. Go ahead and give these a try. Press play when you're ready to see the answers. So now just talking about quantitative data, that data that can be counted or measured, there's actually two types. We could have discrete and continuous. Now discrete is the result of counting. So the number of tosses of a coin before getting tails. We can count these numbers. Whereas continuous data has infinitely many possible quantitative values and it's not really easy to count. So if we were to look at distances between 0 centimeters to 12 centimeters, we could keep adding decimal places in between more and more where we could never actually see a counting measure here. If you're a little bit confused, that's okay. It is a little bit tricky, but with more practice, you'll get the hang of it. So let's take a look at this example. So which of the following describe discrete data? So each of several physicians plans to count the number of physical exams given during the next full week. Casino employees plan to roll a fair die until the number five turns up and they count the number of rolls required to get a five. And three, when the typical patient has blood drawn as part of a routine exam. So looking at number one, they plan to count the number of physical exams. Is it possible to have a half of a physical exam? Are they counting halves and quarters and then like, you know, decimal by decimal, are they, or are they counting whole numbers? Are they counting? And in that case, they are. So that is going to be discrete. Casino employees plan to roll a fair die until the number five turns up. So they're 
rolling the die, they're counting the number of rolls. Would you have half of a count or an eighth or a quarter or 0 0.005 of the counts of a roll? No. So that would be discrete. But the volume of blood, whoops, there's a typo there. The volume of blood between 0 and 50, we could keep going decimal by decimal further and further. And so that is going to be continuous. Go ahead and give that one a try. Press play when you're ready to see the answers. And there we go. Now, even further in data, there are levels of measurement. We can classify data as nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. So go ahead and pause this, maybe take some notes, and we'll go through each one individually. Nominal data is categorized by names, labels. You could think of nominal even as the word name. So survey responses of yes, no, and undecided, those are nominal levels of measurement because we can't really count yes, yes plus no equals nothing. The next level is ordinal level. This is data that can be arranged in order, but we wouldn't subtract the data. The data that would be subtracted would be meaningless. So course grades A, B, C, D, F, those do go in order but we still aren't going to add and subtract an A and a B. So these would be ordinal. Next up is interval. Now, interval can be arranged in order and the differences make sense. So when we subtract these data values, they're meaningful, but the value of zero isn't meaningful because it doesn't mean none of the quantity is present. So it really wouldn't make sense to say that zero year doesn't mean no year. So that would be interval because the zero doesn't really mean nothing. And this will be easier with more examples as well. Ratio is the highest level of measurement. It can be arranged in order. Differences can be found in our meaningful and where zero actually indicates none. So if we have class time of 50 minutes and 100 minutes, if we have zero minutes of class time, we have no class time. That makes sense. So that would be ratio. You can pause this to get a little hint from the textbook about ways to distinguish the two of these. One thing I like is about temperature. If it's zero degrees, we wouldn't say it has no heat or no temperature. So it wouldn't be ratio because the zero doesn't make sense. So here's a little summary. And why don't you go ahead and give this one a try. Press play when you're ready to see the answer. And there we go. Now, Statistics is a really, I mean, obviously I think it's really cool, but statistics is very, very cool and has tons of applications in the real world. And you're gonna see many throughout the course, but there's something called big data and it's data sets that are so large and so complex that it's beyond the capabilities of traditional software. And so it's something that has to be computed on these bigger softwares running in parallel on many different computers. So here are some examples of big data. And here are more examples of big data in the real world, talking about Google and Walmart and Amazon. I mean, we're looking at huge, huge data. So that leads us to data science, which is the application of statistics, computer science, and software engineering, along with other relevant fields, depending on what's appropriate, sociology or finance. So here are some examples of jobs of data scientists and who's hiring them. And then we come to missing data. So sometimes we've got data and the value is missing completely at random. So let's look at this example. So if someone was manually entering in ages of survey respondents and someone's distracted and they make the mistake of failing to enter one, uh, one age, that would be called missing completely at random. It wasn't malicious, it wasn't intentional, it just happens. And that is normal. People have to enter these um, and they make mistakes. But there's missing data that's not at random. And a survey question asked to respondents about his or her annual income, but respondents with very low income skip this question because they find it embarrassing. That is missing data, but it's not random. There's a reason why we don't have that data. So based on those two definitions, um, we can ignore data missing completely at random because it's not likely to be biased and we can still get good results, but if we ignore data that's missing not at random, it's possible that we might have a biased results and we could use 
the results in a misle- we could be using them and they're misleading. If we don't have all the income, can we really make conclusions and decisions? So how can we correct that? Um, we'll be talking about that in later chapters, but one common method is to delete all subjects having any missing values. So if they've got any missing values in the entire subject or person, their, their values are deleted. Or we impute missing values, which is something we're gonna talk about later. And that concludes section 1.2.